this edition of Come Grow With Us, which we have moved to an online session with Adam Young, who is from the Sock River Watershed District. Um, thank you for your patience as we go through this. Um, just a few little things. We will have time for question and answers throughout the session. Um, so on the sidebar here of our YouTube uh, station, oh, excuse me, that's got to pause that. online session with Adam Young, who is from the Sock River Watershed District. So now you're going to hear me um, on my other screen. See, as we go through this, um, just a few. There we go. All right. So you can certainly drop a question there, and I'll make sure Adam gets it, and he'll go ahead and answer those uh, throughout the program. Um, one quick note: uh, our next Come Grow With Us program, which was actually going to be our horticulture night, scheduled for July 30th. Rather than being in person, we are moving that event online, so you can check out more information about that on the WCRF website. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam. Um, I believe he's gonna share his screen so you can see his PowerPoint and we'll get going. Sure, so I'm, I'm assuming folks can see me now. Um, yeah, I'm Adam Delmer from Sock River Watershed District. Uh, I kind of have the greatest job ever. Most of my job is I rotate around to, oh, about 80 some different schools, set up uh, programs for kids. And then I do a lot of community education, uh, teach at the colleges, St. John, St. Cloud State, places like that um, on a normal year. Uh, this year, it's a lot of uh, website and PR and a lot of community ed through Zoom. So if you don't know what the Sock River Watershed or you don't know what a watershed is, the Sock River Watershed District is just all the land that drains into the Sock River. Uh, we're parts of five counties and kind of uh, the area we're at that most people know is we go from Alec all the way down to St. Cloud. So Alexander to St. Cloud and then almost over to Painesville. So we have parts of five it's counties. It's on uh, both my screens. Yeah. So what it's, I get I'm going to do is I'll get going right away in the PowerPoint. Um, so I'll share my screen. We'll see the PowerPoint. We'll clip along to a few slides and then I'll stop. And then we'll uh, have some questions if there is any. All right, so at the uh, Sock Watershed, uh, the, the Healthy Lawns class done, oh, probably done it a hundred times or more now. It was one at first that our board and other staff kind of, uh, kind of beat me up on it a little bit because they said, well, we're supposed to be teaching people or can, getting people to do native plants and prairie restorations and rain gardens and getting rid of lawn. Um, and my argument then and still is that lawns, turf grass is the number one crop in the U.S., if I remember right. So there's more, more folks have turf grass than have corn and beans. Um, and whether you live on the lake or you live in town, what you're doing on that lawn can affect the water quality of their environment. Uh, the healthier your lawn is, in theory, the healthier the resource near you. Whether you live right on the lake or if you live in town, uh, all those storm drains all over town, pretty much a straight pipe into a lake or a river. If it's a newer street, they might have done some sort of treatment, uh, but for the most part, those manholes or those storm drains go right into a lake or river. So grass clippings, fertilizer, chemicals, all that potentially will end up in the environment. So the better job we do with our lawns, hopefully uh, the better the water resources are. So we are gonna bounce all over the place. Uh, I'm gonna cover some random stuff at the end. Having done this class a lot, I know there's random questions. Uh, we'll talk about watering, fertilizing, kind of establishing turf if you're looking at getting a new lawn going. Uh, we'll talk about weeds, which usually is the most questions, uh, usually creeping Charlie, that's everybody's number one question usually. We'll talk a little bit about soil testing, thatching or dethatching, aerating, um, we'll talk really quickly about kind of the common varieties of turf grass and then mowing and then some cool new stuff that's out there. We'll touch quick on some of the no mow and the bee lawns or pollinator lawns that are out there. A lot of my info that I have is from Extension from the U of M. Um, I'm a Stearns County Master Gardener. I live in Douglas County, so I help them out quite a bit too. So I lean on the U of M and Extension a lot for information. They're an amazing resource, resource and uh, especially the, the U with their turf grass, and you have turf grass scientists there. It's, it's an awesome resource. I'm a biologist. Uh, education was my major, so I'm a teacher by trade, so I got to do a little bit of biology on here. This is kind of what you're looking at for your lawn, up super close. 
couple things that I want to point out. The, the stolons are the rhizomes or the roots that go off. So when the grass spreads or when it sends out new little runners and then the new grass spreads from there. Um, so once it establishes, depends on the grass, then it'll kind of thicken up and that's how it does it with those roots. The other thing is this crown that's right in the dead center here, especially right now that's super important because uh, we haven't got rain. It's super dry. My yard is all burned up here in Osakis for the most part. Uh, and most of you folks out west of here, your lawns are pretty dry and crunchy. And it's fine to let your lawns go dormant, but if you're out there stomping around, the kids are playing, these crowns become really, really sensitive. And if you crush them while they're dormant, then you're gonna have some big issues uh, later on with the health of your lawn. So it's fine to let it go dormant, just kind of stay off of it a little bit. So, and it's those crowns right in the middle that we worry about. Um, Probably one of the better graphics or the best graphics that are out there, uh, Minnesota lawn growth patterns. So we kind of have these two big booms, one's right away in the, in the spring. Uh, this time of year, your lawn, the roots die back a little bit. There's not a lot of top growth. It is stressed out, unless you're watering it like crazy. Um, and in the fall, then we get a big boom again. Uh, big growth, pulls a lot of the nutrients down. Uh, you get big big masses of healthy roots that are gonna last through the winter as it goes dormant again. Uh, why this graphic is so important uh, is when we come into talking about fertilizing. Uh, despite what you've heard, probably the worst time to fertilize is in the spring, early in the spring. Later on in the fall is the best time uh, because they're gonna, the grass is gonna pull the, the nutrients and the fertilizer down into the roots. It's gonna be much better off. But we'll touch on that, we'll get back to that. Uh, if you've never done soil testing on your lawn, I would greatly suggest it. The U is an awesome resource. Uh, I think it's under 20 bucks right now. It's like $17 for soil testing. And it's especially important if you've got just that weird area where you just can't get anything to grow. Uh, you just, your turf grass doesn't do there very well there at all. Maybe that's time to do a soil test. Or in general, your lawn's kind of struggling a little bit. Um, I would suggest doing a soil test. And there's, uh, there's a couple of different ways. There's handouts from the U. I've got some stuff on the, on the end here that I'll have a link for all that. Um, whether you do a soil test just for that small area that doesn't do very well, or you're doing your whole big lawn. And I'm gonna bounce out of here. So if you're doing your whole lawn, then you just ran, grab a five gallon pail, grab a little garden trowel, and just randomly go through your yard, take a good scoop out, put it in the five gallon bear, uh, pail. Do that for six, seven, eight spots, depending on how big your yard is. Shake it up, mix it up really well, pull all the grass, the roots and the dead stuff and the leaves, all that out. And then you take a scoop of that soil that you've all mixed up, put it in a Ziploc bag and you mail it off to the U and they'll do a soil test for you. If you have a spot or an area that you're really struggling with, then I would just do that small area instead of uh, doing your whole lawn. So thing to keep in mind though with lawn is and we'll talk about the different varieties, but it's, it's like other plants. Don't, don't necessarily try to force grass to grow where it's not going to grow. Um, whether it's super shady, super wet, things like that, there's probably better plants that you could be, you could be trying to put in there. I suppose I could ask, do you have any questions yet? We have not seen any questions pop up yet, but if you do, feel free to uh, pop it on the, the channel here and I can let Adam know. They're a quiet bunch tonight. Mm -hmm. All right, what happened here? There we go. So going back to the soil testing, um, you know, NPK is your, your fertilizer needs. So the three letters, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, most lawns are shooting for kind of that neutral range, maybe a little on the acidic side. Most of the soils are going to be fine unless you've got a ton of pine trees or something like that. Um, you can do the soil testing any time of the year. The spring and the fall is a little bit better because you won't have a ton of grass growing in roots and leaves and stuff like that to, uh, to go through. And then where, I kind of said that already, whether you're going to do the whole big picture, chunk of your lawn, or you're just going to do a, a small chunk where you can't get anything to grow. Um, and the handouts are all in the U on extension, um, and I'll have a link to that too. 
And here we go in fertilizing. So just some really, 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 we're gonna go over fertilizing briefly and kind of touch on things a little bit. And overall in the presentation tonight, I'm really just trying to touch on everything a little bit. Um, and then if we have questions, we'll kind of follow up from that. So fertilizing, um, on every bag, you're gonna find the analysis and nutrients in the bag. And that's those three numbers on the front. And if it is a lawn fertilizer, the phosphorus number, number the middle number, legally has to be zero. Um, we have plenty of phosphorus in the soil. As you go west a little bit, you folks out there and some a lot of sand issues out there, you still have probably plenty of phosphorus in the soil. Um, lots of different fertilizers out there. There's natural, there's manufactured. They have wildly different characteristics, um, wildly different chemicals or nutrients that they're even made up of. Um, and all types of the fertilizer can be pollution if they're not used correctly. Um, spot treating the weeds might be more effective than a weed and feed product over your whole lawn. And we'll touch on the herbicides a little bit later on. Uh, natural fertilizers like organic products, they usually have a lower concentration of the nutrient. So higher quantities might be needed. And a lot of time the natural fertilizers, uh, the organics, they're a, they're a slow release. So they're not a real big blast of fertilizer. A lot of them are gonna be a, a slow release. Um, and the slow release usually are a little more environmentally friendly because you can kind of control them a little bit more. Um, and a lot of them are natural products too. And cheaper doesn't always mean better. And I always do the laundry detergent comparison on there. Um, when I tell people, you know, if you go to, I don't know, you go to Walmart, you buy like the five gallon jug of laundry detergent, that's all watered down and you got to put three cups into your washing machine. You can instead buy the concentrated and maybe you only got to put a little cup in there. So it depends on the fertilizer. So definitely kind of read the label, know what you're getting. It'll have application rates on there. It'll talk about the nitrogen rates, um, things like that. And so really quickly, so here's a, a good, just I don't know what brand that is, lawn food bag. And again, you can see, so the first number, the 32 is the nitrogen, uh, the zero is the phosphorus and four is like the, the potash or the potassium, things like that. Nitrogen is really what you're trying to, trying to give your lawn. Um, it's what gives it the, the dark green color, puts down the heavy root growth. That's what you're shooting for. The phosphorus, very rarely, if ever, do you need it for your grass. Uh, especially if you're really heavy soils, plenty of phosphorus in the soil. And that's why the middle number is zero in the state of Minnesota, because uh, we had so many folks in towns that were fertilizing with like a 10, 10, 10 or something that were dumping a ton of phosphorus that was going down the storm drains. It was getting in the lakes and one pound of phosphorus equals 500 pounds of algae. So why put down a product that we don't need that's just gonna end up in a wetland or a lake and cause all kinds of issues. So the only time that you'll probably see a lawn fertilizer with the middle number not zero is if it's like, a, like an establishing, like a seed starter or something like that to get the turf really established. And they'll say right on there, that's what it's for. Um, the only other exceptions would be like commercial places, like, oh, like a golf course, they might put down some phosphorus, uh, maybe a city park, maybe on campus even, they might put a little bit down where there's tons of traffic. They're really trying to get that lawn to look amazing. Um, and the potassium, the last number, again, it's gonna be usually less than 10. It's just some micronutrients kind of give, you know, a little round, rounded food value to it. Um, a lot of times some compost or soil amendments or something like that is a better option for sandy soils. And that's where we usually see it, like sandy soils, just because a lot of times that fertilizer moves through that soil so quickly. Um, just not very, not, not a great amount of organics or anything in that sandy soil. And then, like I said in the beginning, contrary to popular belief in every TV and radio commercial you hear, spring is a bad time to fertilize. Um, like early spring. You're shooting for like Memorial Day or later. Um, the problem with spring fertilizing is it jump starts it and instead of slowly developing and, and their roots developing, it puts all the energy into top growth. So you get all kinds of beautiful lush green grass up top, but then when it comes to like now, well, it's really dry and the grass is stressed out, there's not much for roots there. 
uh, and it actually will, lots of diseases, it'll try to go dormant. It just won't be a very healthy lawn. Um, so wait, like Memorial Day, don't, don't jump the gun too much. Like wait till it's greened up and really get going and then do that first shot of fertilizer out there. Um, again, you're just waiting for that plant to develop the roots down there and then it's good to go. Fall fertilizing, by far the best time. Um, most plants, including turf, they're gonna pull the nutrients that's up in the top down into the roots, store it for the winter. So if you give it a blast of fertilizer, then uh, it's gonna do a better job of, you're gonna get some top growth, give it a little boost, but then it's gonna pull a lot of those nutrients down into the root systems that are developing. Um, and you wanna avoid like the Indian summer, you know, watch the weather a little bit, not freezing at night yet, um, you know, into September, right around through there. Uh, and in the fall, a 50-50 slow and quick, quick release is, is the best. Uh, the quick release is going to make it really bounce up, good to go. And then that slow release that's in there is slowly going to trickle into the soil or break down. So you're going to have a lot more root growth. And I'd avoid organics in the fall because they just take too long to break down or too long for that plant to get a hold of it. So the plant's probably going to go dormant or the ground, ground's going to freeze before those organics get into the soil or where, where it's available for the turf grass. Uh, a super, super general rule is one pound of nitrogen to a thousand square feet. Uh, and a lot of people ask, well, how, how the heck do I know how much a pound of nitrogen is? You're gonna have to flip the bag over and read what the actual concentration of nitrogen is in that bag of fertilizer. And usually they're really, really good about, this is the product, this is what's in it, this is how much nitrogen, and then figure out, all right, this is what my square footage of lawn is, I know it's gonna take half the bag or the whole bag, kind of that thing. So a pound of nitrogen, thousand square feet, really, really good general rule. Um, the tricky folks are if you got super sandy soil, then you might have to, you might actually have to fertilize more because uh, when you get into really sandy soil, the issues are the turf grass roots are only three or four inches down. So if you get really, really sandy soil, that fertilizer wants to move through that soil really quickly. So if you put a big blast on there, it might move through the soil so quickly that some of it doesn't get absorbed. So you're probably better off to do like a half application, wait a few weeks, do another half application, just give it some time to get in there. Any questions so far, I guess? No, good to go, living the dream. Yeah, we, we are good. I haven't seen any questions pop up yet. All right. I don't know what happened. Let's, let's share this one then. All right. It's like seventh graders, eighth graders. Nobody's got questions tonight. Uh, and the fertilizer. So we're gonna have a little humor to it. So I wouldn't go out and buy a new fertilizer spreader by any means. But if you're going to buy one, the actual like spray one or the flinger one or whatever you want to call it is much better. Um, it's going to kind of put a more even coat out. It's going to spread it in a certain area. If you drive around like Memorial Day, and hopefully you can see the bottom right picture, uh, folks that have drop spreaders, you always see a few like that. Uh, if you do have a drop spreader, like the one where it just trickles straight down, my suggestion is go over it both ways. Go like east and west and then go north and south. Uh, so that way, if you did miss any, you've caught it the second time. But then remember, you're putting down at like half the rate. So that way you're not putting down twice as much fertilizer. So kind of, yeah, do a checkerboard pattern on it. You're shooting for, you know, not having racing stripes in your lawn. Guarantee you drive around like Memorial Day, you'll see, you'll see these folks. But again, I wouldn't buy a brand new sp spreader by any means. Uh, a couple other things, top left picture up here, no matter how much you fertilize your sidewalk or the, the street on the top right, it's not gonna grow. All you're doing is flinging fertilizer out in the street, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your money, and it's gonna have an environmental effect. Um, so figure out how far that thing actually flings the fertilizer and then stay that far away from the sidewalk or the street. Uh, the top picture up here, we see the dude, he's just pouring it in there. Move over onto the sidewalk when you do that. Uh, because it's really hard to, if, if any trickles through there, you're going to get a pile on your lawn right there. 
And if you don't clean that up, it'll actually burn and kill that lawn. So if you move over on a hard surface or put a piece of cardboard down or something, so that way if you spill, you can pick it up. Um, so over a hard surface, sweep it up, clean it up, that kind of thing. You also could, you know, if you fling it out in the driveway, just sweep it up, pick it up. Um, you paid for it, so why waste it kind of thing. If you read the label, um, there used to be this huge misconception, <clears throat> excuse me, that like tonight is supposed to rain. Hopefully it rains in Osaka tonight, but people would hustle out and fertilize before it rains. That's actually about the worst thing you can do. Uh, it's bad for the environment, plus that fertilizer will get washed into the soil. I mean, if it rains really heavy, it might get washed right off the top. Or it'll soak through the soil so fast that it'll get down below the roots on the grass. So you might have it soak into the soil. It soaks in, goes down six inches. Now the turf can't get a hold of it. Um, a lot of it is designed for certain temperatures to break down and not have water involved at all. So usually you, you read the label, it's going to say a day or two, uh, avoid watering, avoid rain for a day or two. Um, you know, keep in mind the weather's not 100% predictable, but you know, if it's going to rain, avoid it. And then keep the pets off there, keep the kids off there. If it's a liquid product, most of the time after it's dry, it's fine. Uh, but a lot of them will say, keep the kids off, keep the pets off for, for a day, for 24 hours. And then the big thing, read the label, read the label, read the label, follow the instructions, watch the weather, um, avoid the rain, I already said that, avoid heat. A lot of them will have a temperature range on there. So they're not, especially a slow release. They've got like a coating on that fertilizer and it's gonna break down over a certain time period. If it rains, that coating breaks down really fast. Um, and if it's really hot, you get really, really hot days, like today it's like 95 right now, I think. Um, that coating might break down, actually might burn the lawn because that chemical comes out so fast. So read the label, follow the instructions. Uh, I tell people kind of figure out how big your yard is before you go to Menards or Walmart or wherever and buy your fertilizer. So that way you're, you're not dropping an extra 20 bucks on fertilizer you don't need. So kind of know what your square footage is and then buy your fertilizer based off of that. Um, I'm not a huge brand name guy, I would say read the label instead. So whether you buy the generic stuff or you buy it in bulk at the co-op or the country store or somewhere like that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if Scott's is that much better than the Walmart brand. So read the label, see what you got there. Uh, don't just buy it because it's, you know, Scott's Turf Builder or something. And then watering, um, for some of us that ship a sale for watering this, this summer, or at least anytime now, uh, like I talked about in the beginning, when your lawn goes dormant, which is fine, it gets brown and crispy, stay off of it. Um, and you don't have to water it, it's, it's, it's evolved to that. It'll go dormant, it's usually Kentucky bluegrass that does that. The One of the worst things or the most stressful things you can do to your lawn, um, I keep bouncing back and forth here, is once it starts to go dormant. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, your yard started going brown, then you watered the heck out of it for a day or two. It perked up a little bit, it got a little green, and then you haven't watered it for another week. Now it started to go dormant again. Then you panicked and thought, geez, I better water again. Then you water. So just make the decision you're gonna water and consistently water, or you're gonna let it go dormant uh, because it stresses it out when you bounce it back and forth. Plus it uses a lot of energy uh, to, to recover from dormancy. So just decide, either you're gonna keep watering it, keep it green, keep your irrigation system running, or you're just gonna say, you know what, I'm fine, goes dormant, um, not a big deal. And just watering really quickly. So new turf, uh, your goal with new turf is to, to keep it wet. So you're trying to get those seeds to germinate. You're trying to get the little roots to develop, get in the top quarter inch, half inch of soil. Um, your, your goal is to not let it dry out. So it depends on the weather. And that's why planting grass by far, you want to shoot for the spring or the fall. You certainly wouldn't want to try to plant grass seed right now while it's 95 degrees out. It's, it's a losing battle unless you absolutely have to, but um, shoot for the spring and the fall. And new turf, you're just trying to keep it kind of moist, kind of wet. You don't want it to fully dry out. And there is a little con to that. You're probably gonna get weed seeds to germinate. Uh, shadier areas, you might get a little mold risk. Uh, but overall, 
you're going to have more seeds germinate and they're going to establish a little bit better. So, you know, water, stick your finger in the soil, take your little shovel out there, see how far that water is getting in there. You want that top quarter inch, half inch to stay, to stay relatively moist all the time. Sometimes you might have to water twice a day, but it might only be a little bit versus uh, established turf. We're looking for an inch of uniform water and we want the we want the surface, like the top inch or two, to fully dry out between your waterings. Um, it's going to promote deeper root growth, thicker root growth. Those roots are going to get down three, four, five inches where they need to be instead of having roots that are only an inch deep. Uh, and, you know, folks that have a sprinkler, folks that maybe have an irrigation system, everybody asks, well, how, how much, how do I know how much an inch of water is? A couple of things you can do, go down to Wally World or Ace Hardware, buy a $3 rain gauge. Stick that on on your lawn, turn the sprinkler on, and then just go check. And now you'll know after a half an hour, maybe it's a half an inch of water. Full hour, there might be an inch of water in that rain gauge. E really, really easy way. Um, don't necessarily go by your irrigation system's settings or what it tells you it's going to put out either. So even if you have an irrigation system, stick a rain gauge out there. Let that irrigation system run for half an hour. Go see how much water it puts out in a half an hour. Um, really, really easy way to do that. The other way, take your garden trowel, stick it in there, pull some soil back and see how far down in that, that water is actually soaked. Uh, you're, you're trying to get you know, water to go down an inch, two inches or more. Um, and then you just say, all right, after half an hour, I know it's getting that far down in my soil, then I'm good to go. And that's a good way to, to check out when you need the water too. If you dig down and it's bone dry, then maybe you want to bump that, uh, that irrigation system on or water a little bit more. You're kind of at the mercy of the weather, different times of the year, you might have to water. If you're going to water consistently, you know, in the spring, the fall, you might not have to water very much. Middle of the summer, you might have to water every other day. You know, days like today where it's 95 and windy, everything's drying out. I gave up on my hanging baskets. I even brought them in the garage because I, I'm pretty sure there's no way I could water them enough to keep them alive the last two or three days. No. Uh, the rain gauge trial test, I said that. Soil test is important too. Uh, you're gonna have to water more if you have really, really sandy soil. If you have heavy clay soil, you can get by probably not watering nearly as much. Um, but don't, you know, don't wait for your lawn to go dormant. Um, keep on it if you're gonna water or just, like I said, it's probably good and let it go dormant. Be, be happy with the crunch of your lawn. Sit on the deck and have a cocktail because you don't have to mow the lawn anymore for a while, right? Uh, speaking of mowing, so one of the one of the quickest ways you can really screw up your lawn is, is, is butchering it, not mowing. Um, poor mowing habits can, can topple all your hard work. You can stress out that lawn every which way um, just, just by not mowing correctly. Uh, sharp blades, absolutely a must. I always tell people sharpen in the fall uh, because we, we never have enough time in the spring. So when you put the mower away for the year, sharpen it in the fall. Um, check every other month as you're mowing. A good way, a uh, good way to know if your blades are sharp is give it a day or two after you've mowed and then look and see if the tips of your grass are brown or ragged. They're going to look all ragged looking. Uh, you're not clean cutting the grass at that point, you're ripping it. So you'll see the tips of the grass, it'll look really ragged and it'll be all kind of brown looking. Uh, then it's time to touch up your mower blades. And if you talk to, you know, a lot of times like cities, um, oh, gee, cities, parks, even the university, they might be mowing or they might be sharpening their blades once a month or more. So it depends on what you got going on in your lawn. You know, if you're going across the driveway or you got some sandy areas, uh, it's going to beat up your, your blades quite a bit. Um, the other approach that a lot of people do is they don't sharpen their blade until after they've mowed one time in the spring. Uh, you're going to find every toy your kid left out, every bone the dog left out, every piece of rope, whatever, that first time you mow. So anything you're going to hit in the lawn is going to be the first time you mow. And then maybe you want to sharpen them after that. So, uh, rough rule: never cut more than thirty percent at a time. Usually, it ends up a lot of clumpy material. Uh, plus, it stresses out the grass a lot if you're really whacking it back that much. Um, and leave the clippings on. 
free green fertilizer unless you got a lot of material there. Mulching blades, those are the ones you definitely have to double check. They're doing a lot of work trying to cut up that material really super fine. So if you got a mulcher, um, sharpen those blades a lot. Whether you just cut them up or you know you take them to Ace Hardware or wherever and have, have them do it. Any questions on mowing or on the soils or anything? I don't see any questions pop up yet, but you are welcome to leave it there over on the right-hand side of the screen. You can certainly type in a question if you have it and I'll make sure that Adam gets it. Perfect. All right, here's where everybody always has questions. If, if we don't have any questions now, I'm gonna be disappointed in the group because uh, weeds is what everybody wants to know. Um, healthier lawn, you know, a good defense is better than a, you know, a good offense. So you're better, the healthier your lawn is, the less weeds you're potentially gonna have. You're gonna have a thick, plush lawn. There's not a lot of bare spots where the dandelion seeds or whatever seeds can get going. So the healthier your lawn, so if you're, you know, you're fertilizing, you're watering, you're mowing correctly, hopefully you have a healthier lawn, you're gonna have less weeds. Um, the caveat behind that is a lot of times weeds, it also depends on what your neighbor's lawn looks like. So if they've got a pile of creeping Charlie or they got tons of dandelions or something, you're gonna have to defend your lawn a little bit against that. So most of the weeds are controlled by a good general lawn specific common herbicide. Again, I'm not a huge brand name guy, buy the Fleet Farm brand stuff, buy the co whatever the co-op sells. Um, the co-ops are usually a lot better because then you kind of chat with them a little bit, say, this is a weed I got. Because you, not necessarily do you have to do, like, I'm not a fan of weed and feed, um, or I'm not a huge fan of just spraying your whole lawn if you've got six dandelions. Just go out and spot spray those six dandelions. You know, why spend money, time on chemicals, uh, again, not great for the environment. Just go out and spot spray it and buy the right chemical for the right culprit. You know, if you've got a few dandelions, buy a dandelion specific product. Um, and then stay on top of things. Spot spray, uh, pull out the dandelions, cut them back. Some of the weeds, you know, keep them from blooming, keep them from seeding, you're going to be way better off. Um, and then I always tell people if you are so far behind, you have more creeping Charlie than lawn, maybe at that point call on the professionals, let them get it caught up for you. Um, buddy of mine here a few doors down, he bought a house. Yeah, half the yard was Creeping Charlie. I know in a year he probably spent 500 bucks on chemicals and you know, 20 hours of his time. And he still wasn't getting ahead of it. So the next year he caved and he had True Green or whoever come, they did two applications, it was day and night difference. So if it's that bad, maybe you wanna call on the professionals. Uh, the weeds, a lot of times that we got to talk about, quackgrass, crabgrass. Uh, unfortunately, the ship has sailed for treating those consistently and effectively. The best time to treat quackgrass and crabgrass is right away in the spring. Most of them are annuals, so they're going to come back from the seeds. So a pre-emergent is a way to go on quackgrass and crabgrass. Uh, but keep in mind, it's a pre-emergent, so it's going to keep seeds from sprouting. So if you put that down, your grass seed won't sprout either. Um, and you'll see a chart coming up that I've kind of got, talks about that a little bit, but crabgrass, crabgrass, spring and the fall, the best time. Spring is without a doubt, pre-emergence on those. Uh, I'm gonna skip Creepy Charlie and come back to it. Uh, clover, usually it's the Dutch white clover, little white flowers, pretty low to the ground. Um, Unless it's a huge problem, that's when I tell people embrace it a little bit. It's putting nitrogen back in the soil. It's a good pollinator plant. But if you don't like it, um, plenty of products out there that'll control clovers. Plantain usually, plantain is a real flat ribbed. Uh, weed grows really flat down to the ground. Usually that's in a really wet or shady area. And a lot of those times when you have a lot of plantain, you got other issues going on in the shade there. You're like your turf grass isn't doing very well. So switch to a different type of grass or put a flower bed or something else in there. Um, you know, some of those really heavy, wet, shady areas, trying to force turf grass to grow there, it's, it's, it's a losing battle. So dandelions, tons of products out there for dandelions. Uh, my suggestion on some of these weeds is get out there right away in the spring. 
uh, you know, a lot of folks aren't, aren't chemical people. They're worried about the pollinators and all that. And that's, I'm not a huge chemical person. So if I try, if I try to get after the weeds with a herbicide, I try to get out there before they bloom. So if you can get after them before they bloom, you're going to help the pollinators out because they're not going to be pulling that up. Um, the other thing is once they bloom and go to seed, you're going to fight that seed or that plant next year too. So the earlier, the better. So thistles, uh, moss, mushrooms, molds, a lot of those are treated with a, uh, a, a product that is uh, copper sulfate in it. So you can buy that product. You can buy all kinds of products that have copper sulfate in there, copper in there. That's what you really need to do. But then again, the moss, the molds, maybe look at what you got going on there. If it's a really wet area and it's more moss and molds than grass, maybe time to switch it up, try a different crop, try a different crop there, try to do something, put a look, put a flower bed in there. Um, and then Creeping Charlie, that's everybody's nemesis by far. Um, I'm gonna to bump to the next slide because having done this class a million times, this is by far the product people recommend. I've even started buying this. It's Fertilome, it's weed-free zone. Um, it's got a bunch of different active ingredients, including one that helps break down the, like that waxy film that's on the Creeping Charlie. So much better bang for your buck. And it's like 25 bucks for a, for a quart or a pint. Um, and it goes a long way. It's only like two ounces per gallon you mix up. So the other nice part with this is this product you can use at much lower temperature. So you can get out there and whack the Creeping Charlie right away in the spring when it first gets going. So um, I know Walmart sell, sells it, country stores do. I'm sure you can buy it online, um, get it shipped there. Um, this is the one a lot of people recommend. The other one that people really recommend if you've got a ginormous lawn and you've got a lot of random broadleaf is Fleet Supply has their brand. It's actually a pasture mix. So it's going to be a general broadleaf herbicide and it's in the farm section, but it's really cheap. Um, but you got to buy like two gallons, I think. It's a big jug. But if you've got a ginormous lawn, you've got a lot of random broadleafs in there, that'd be the, the way to go. So that's at Fleet Supply. And I, I don't know if like Morris out there, if you guys got Fleet Supplies, but um, again, I think you can buy all stuff online too. So, so Fertilome and then the Fleet Supply, their pasture mix. And then, you know, shoot the breeze with whoever's working, ask them about it, ask them the product, that kind of stuff. But that is by far the one that people recommend for probably one of the better products, not just for Creeping Charlie, for a lot of general broadleaves. And I, I just spot spray now. I so I only mix up like a gallon. I treat my lawn, my neighbor's lawn, just spot spray a little bit here and there. Um, and you'll see, you'll see within a day or two, even the Creeping Charlie is, is looking pretty tough after a day or two. Uh, really quick, how are we doing on time? I always get chatty, see, and I always run long, so. Dethatching really quickly. Dethatching, you're trying to get rid of the dead material. If you've got a really, really beautiful, productive, healthy, fast growing lawn, you probably have a, a layer of dead material, the thatch. And you need to get rid of that. Um, it's going to increase the water absorption. Water's going to get in the soil better. You're not going to have as many molds and fungus and pests and all that that are living in that dead layer. You're going to get better sun penetration. The time to do dethatching is when the lawn is most actively growing. So the spring or the fall, because it needs to recover because you are beating it up. Um, you can take, you know, take your little shovel out there, take a scoop out, just like the, the ruler there. If you've got more than an inch, that's when you need to dethatch. Um, or just walking around, you can tell if you got a lot of dead material out there. So I think the next picture, so this is my lawn, my backyard. Um, and your lawn will look rough. There's, I better bounce on here. So there's the dethatching. So there's the little springtime ones that you can pull behind your rotting lawnmower. Those are okay. The, the real dethatchers are almost like a stock chopper, like a corn stock chopper. They actually have fingers that tumble, um, over a bar inside. And actually you can set it. They'll go down. You want them to go into the soil a quarter inch or a half inch or more and rip up that dead material. And you will think the first time, if you've never done it, the first time you do it, you'll think, my goodness, what did I just do to my lawn? Because it will look terrible. 
Um, and I don't know if you can see the how big the piles are, but uh, like my Ford Ranger, I think this, you know, like three loads in the back of my, my truck. That's how much dead material was there. Um, it is amazing. And good time to fertilize after here, overseed a little bit, maybe put down some more grass seed. Um, it recovers really fast. Um, but again, spring, the fall, when the grass is most actively going, growing. You wouldn't want to do it in the middle of summer because your grass is you know, kind of dormant or not doing much. Um, I wouldn't go buy a dethatcher. You know, you can go to, I don't know, Guy or Rental or one of the rental places, rent them. They're like a little walk behind push mowers, all they are. Uh, rent it for half a day. You know, here, our rental place is like 25 bucks for half a day to rent them. Get in with the neighbors, do your neighborhood, do three, four neighbors, same time. Uh, yeah, rent. I would definitely rent one versus buying it. Aerating, um, again, the, the little spike ones that you see, they can actually be worse because they actually can compact the soil even more, especially if you have really, really heavy clay soil. The aerating that you want to do is the apple core ones, like you're seeing in the picture. And you've probably driven around, like campus probably has it or some of the parks around there. Uh, a lot of times in the fall, you'll see that. And it looks like, again, it looks terrible because it looks like a million apple cores or dog poop laying all over the place. You're trying to open up that soil. You're trying to get some air in there. You're trying to loosen it up. Um, it increases drainage, better root growth, aeration. Um, maybe every two or three years, it depends on how heavy your soil is. Um, one of the master gardeners that presents on aerating a lot, they say, take your shovel out there. When you get through the turf grass, through the roots, like jump up on that shovel. If that shovel doesn't slide in very easily, you probably need to aerate. Or if you got really heavy soil and you've never done it, you probably need to do it. Um, again, I wouldn't buy the equipment, just go to the rental place and get it. Um, this is one where watch the weather. Uh, if you have the time to, you know, if you're flexible on your time, because this is a great one to do when it's gonna rain the next day. Um, so you aerate the next day it rains, pretty much all those little clumps of soil dissolve. So great way to watch the weather. Um, and then water and fertilize if possible. Um, rake sometimes if you want, that'll bust up those little clods. And uh, if you have a history of crack grass and crabgrass in your lawn, I would do a pre-emergent uh, herbicide at that point because you're gonna, you're gonna kind of activate that seed bank or you're gonna jumpstart a lot of those seeds in that crack grass and crabgrass, um, especially if you're doing it right away in the spring or even late in the fall. But for the most part, water fertilize, watch the weather, um, they'll break down in a big hurry. This is a graphic from the U of M, probably like the most amazing picture you're gonna see from me tonight. Um, it tells you exactly when to do stuff. Um, the red is the best time to perform that activity and the, the dotted line is the okay, it's, it's acceptable. So like seeding, spring, yeah, not bad while the weather's still chilly. In the fall, way better time. And then this November one here, they're dormant seeding. They're actually putting seed down knowing it's not gonna grow till the next year, uh, which is great as long as you don't have a really steep lawn or you get a lot of water movement. Because again, that seed's gonna kind of just hang out on the top. And if you get a lot of runoff in the spring, it's gonna wash it away. Why fall is better is uh, think about May. Sometimes you, you know, sometimes Memorial Day it's 95 degrees, versus in the fall tends to be cooler nights, more moisture. So it gives a kind of a longer, longer cool period for that grass to get germinated. Um, sodding spring and fall, avoid the middle of the summer. You're going to be out there watering like a mad person otherwise. Fertilizing again in the spring, eh, fall without a doubt, way better to go. The, the thing about fertilizing in the spring is, you know, you got a graduation, you got a wedding or something, you could fertilize it, stiff it up a little bit, but keep in mind, it's, it's not the best time. It's not the healthiest time for that grass. Um, mowing all year, sharpen your blades, watering. And then again, watering, decide if you're going to keep watering, either keep that grass growing in green or in the middle of summer, let it go dormant. So one or the other. Aeration dethatching, spring 
or fall. Spring's okay. Um, fall is a little bit better. Again, that grass is going to recover better in the fall with the cooler temperatures. Weed control, again, we're doing the pre-emergence. So get it before it starts growing, before those seeds germinate. And then weed control, a lot of the broadleafs, like spot spray them in the spring or get them before they're blooming. In the fall is a lot better time, uh, especially for things like dandelions, thistles. A lot of farmers know this, uh, especially thistles, because they take all the nutrients that are in the top and then they pull them down into the roots for the, for the winter, for the fall. So if you put an herbicide on, they're going to pull that down into their roots too. So like thistles or even creeping charlie that have amazing root systems, you're going to get a better bang for your buck, a better kill in the fall because it's going to pull the chemical down into the roots a lot more. So, questions? I still haven't seen anyone raise any questions, so I think we'll just keep okay. forging ahead. Perfect. All right, really quickly, I'm going to go through uh, the different varieties. If you've got an older established lawn, lots of sun, you've definitely got Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, probably the most common turf grass there is. Does not grow in the shade very well at all. So that's where, you know, if you're fighting weeds, you got moss and mildew or something like that in the shadier area, don't put Kentucky bluegrass there. We'll talk about some other ones that you should put there instead. Or again, just give up on grass there maybe. Uh, planting source seed or sod. Um, Kentucky bluegrass develops amazing root systems. You know, they don't go very deep, but they're pretty tangled up. So that's where sod works fine. Uh, mowing height, inch and a half, three inches. I would favor the three inches. Um, and then, yeah, you got a baby turf grass. So it needs irrigation and fertilizing. Um, overall low maintenance once you get it going. And then it'll go dormant in the summer, which again is fine. You know, if you're, if you're okay with it going dormant, let it go dormant. There are a ton of hybrids or improved Kentucky bluegrasses. A lot of them are still pretty poor on the shade tolerance. They're gonna to be seed or sod, um, inch and a half to three inches. I still would lean toward the three inches. Um, this is a little more forgiving, like a little bit better on the shade. Um, doesn't need quite as much irrigation and fertilizing. Uh, still goes dormant, um, still is that beautiful green. A lot of these are just a little bit more forgiving um, or they're more disease resistant. So some of these improved Kentucky bluegrasses. Uh, perennial ryegrass, a lot of times this is what you'll see like on a football field or I don't know, at schools or parks or big areas. Uh, it's pretty cheap. It fills in really well. It's the really wide bladed grasses. If you ever drove around and saw a park or a football field and you thought well, that grass looks a little bit different. It's probably a ryegrass um, it, and it's kind of the middle of the road. So if you get a sunshade mix, you buy grass that's a sunshade mix from Menards, probably a ryegrass because odds are it's gonna do okay in either one of those. So uh, it de doesn't develop quite as thick of root system. So you hardly ever see any ryegrass that comes uh, in a turf material. It's almost always gonna be seeds. Still needs irrigation, still needs fertilization. Um, it won't completely go dormant, but it'll get just a terrible greenish yellow color in the middle of summer. And again, rougher texture, usually like a big wide blade on it. And that's where people don't necessarily like it. Plus it's not super, super dark green. Um, but for big areas, great grass to go with. And here's where if you've got a shade area, a uh, wet area, uh, I always say fescue to the rescue. I'm sure a lot of people say that. I probably stole that from somebody, but fescues to the rescue. So fescues, you've, you've seen them without a doubt. They're that real wispy kind of thinner looking grass. Uh, can flatten down if you let it get too tall. It grows really slowly, um, but it is, a lot of them are Canadian blends. A lot of the fescues are, are Canadian blends but it'll do better in shade. It'll do better in wetter areas, kind of that cooler side of your house, that kind of stuff. Um, so wet area shade, without a doubt, you want grass, find some fescue. And there are a million fescue mixes out there. So um, great shade, uh, shade tolerance. The planting source, again, is gonna be seed. And this is one mow, like two inches, give or take. Depends on the fescue. Some of them are no mow. Some of them never get taller than three inches. Um, 
Some people like to mow fescues a little bit shorter though, because they get really wispy and they'll flatten out. So if it's established, you can get by, get by with mowing this a little bit shorter. So need some irrigation, might need a little boost to fertilizer, uh, but not nearly the maintenance as Kentucky bluegrass. It grows a lot slower too. So. And then the cool new exciting stuff, since I was talking about fescues, uh, lots of no mow lawn mixes out there or low mow. And you can see on the pictures on the right here, the top one up here, go down to the Twin Cities or even St. Cloud now, they're using a lot of these low mow or no mow fescue mixes for boulevards because then they don't have to spend the city staff to mow them or mow them as often or uh, even mow them at all. The other thing is they have a lot deeper roots, especially some of the no mow mixes. So salt doesn't hurt them as much. Um, so a lot of them are eco lawn, a lot of them are fescue mixes. So red, creeping, hard, slender, blue fescue, a lot of Canadian fescue mixes. Uh, they grow slow. So again, you could reduce, maybe you only got to mow every other week or so. Salt tolerant, because they got a lot better root system deeper. Uh, it depends on the type, but a lot of them are shade tolerant. And then once they're established, very little water, very little fertilizer. And then there is a ton of no mow ones that you just don't ever have to mow. Or, you know, you got a wedding or a graduation, you mow it once just to clean it up. Um, but keep in mind, the boulevard picture up here, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be kind of kind of thick and flat now. It's not going to look like that beautiful golf course look to it. Um, but again, you might only mow it once every other week, or maybe you're not going to mow it at all. So buffalo grass, so I put this in here. Buffalo grass is a native to the prairies, um, and that's in a lot of the mixes. And buffalo grass becoming wildly popular. It's got amazing root systems that'll go down 8, 10, 15, 20 feet if need be. Um, so a lot of like high maintenance areas, like really steep uh, shady slopes or somewhere like that, we're putting buffalo grass in. So it never gets really like, a lot of these fescues never get that like wow green color to them. Um, so if you're looking for that, a lot of sun go with Kentucky bluegrass. Boy, this picture didn't look that great. But here's a good one from like a no mow fescue um, on, the, on the left side. And then on the right side, you can see a, a mowed lawn. So you can kind of see the difference to it. Bee lawns really, really quickly become wildly popular. Um, I have a big chunk of bee lawn at my house now, which I love because it's a fescue mix that I maybe mow it once in a great while. It's got uh, and I actually got it from Minnesota Native, so I, I don't own stock in their company or anything, but um, this is a good label. So you can see the different fescue mixes, which hardly will get three, four inches tall, and then Dutch white clover, creeping thyme, self-heal. Those are usually the three that are in there. So what we're looking for in a bee lawn mix, if you go back, um, less maintenance, less chemicals, and now I've got some flowers in there for the pollinators, for the bees. So that's kind of what we're shooting for. You know, it's more environmentally friendly and we got something in there for the pollinators. So you can see a lot of fescues and then Dutch white clover, creeping thyme and self heal. And Dutch white clover is what a lot of people, that little clump of clover you get in your yard with the white flower, that, that's Dutch white clover. Really quickly, cause I know we're running out of time. So random stuff that I always get people asking questions about, dog spots without a, without a doubt, people ask about dog spots. Um, water them as soon as possible. Like the neighbor actually walks around with their dog with follows them with a watering can. When the dog pees, she waters that spot and she has never had a dead spot in her yard. So I give her credit. Like I've learned my lesson there. Um, there's some dog foods you can buy, which kind of scares me a little bit. Um, you know, feeding your dog some kind of chemical or whatever, but spot repairs. So the sooner you can get after it, you know, tear it up a little bit, dig it up, put that new grass in there, get it going. Um, because the sooner you get the grass to grow there, the less likely the weeds will grow there. So snow mold, that is after the snow melts and you get almost looks like cobwebs all over your lawn. Um, pick up the leaves in the lake clippings uh, in the spring. It's just because it's wet there and you had a lot of snow there. They just gently rake it, loosen it up. Once it dries out, it's good to go usually. Um, a lot of people are super allergic to snow molds. So you just kind of be careful with that too. Uh, white grubs, which are usually the June bug grubs. 
usually the bugs aren't the issue, the grubs aren't the issue, it's the skunks and the raccoons and everybody that's digging them up to eat them. Um, there's, there's biological and chemical uh, products that you can use out there. Um, so just be aware of whatever you're after trying to get them. You'll use, they're June bugs and they should be hatching out by now. So you've got a lot of June bugs in your yard, you probably got the grubs around there. And again, it's not usually the bug isn't the issue, it's what's digging them up to eat them. Um, night crawlers, embrace them. I know they're an invasive species, but embrace them if you got them in your lawn. Um, you can rake it or roll out that area. You know, it's not necessarily the night crawlers, it's their little piles are making your lawn really uneven. Um, Dethatching, that's one of the reasons I dethatch. I've got like the best worm bed in all of Douglas County up here. Uh, my lawn is unbelievably bumpy and rough in the spring. Um, so that's another reason why I dethatch or why I thatch. Gets rid of that dead material and then knocks all that, levels it out a lot. Moles, so moles and voles, moles are the ones that are under the ground, uh, making big tunnels, killing off big patches. Voles are the ones after the snow melts, you see the little racing stripes all over the place. Um, physically trap them. There are chemicals that you can buy uh, that irritate them. Um, usually it just shags them over near your neighbor's yard, so be aware of that. So physically trap them. A lot of times the voles and the, and the mice are going to be near the bird feeder. Uh, so just kind of clean up around the bird feeder a little bit. All right, so really, really quickly, um, most of you don't live in the soccer or watershed district, which is fine. Um, we do lots of programs all over. So if you want this PowerPoint and you also want informational folder and we put out a native plant book at the watershed, if you shoot me an email uh, that includes on the bottom here, quick email with uh, the class, like the turf grass class and your mailing address, I will send you that folder full of information our native plant book, and then I'll throw your names into a hat for a drawing for a prize. And uh, really quick on our website, srwdmn.org, join our mailing list because I give a lot of free stuff away on there. Plus we have a lot of good newsletters. Um, I do them so they're more geared toward like events and news and like hardcore watershed stuff. So, and you can pick and choose which mailing list you want. You want the general news and events one. That is my contact info. Um, we are working from home now. So if you call the office, it just rolls over to our cell phones anyways. So, but Adam, A-D-A-M at srwdmn.org. Um, and email me, call me. Even if you don't live in the district, you got questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Or I'll try to put you in contact with the right people or the people in your area. And we do have a, a question that somebody posed here, so I'll read it to you so you can hear it. Uh, this spring I had patches of dead grass that I've never had before. Why did I have the patches of dead grass? What should I do to repair the dead patches? And what kind of grass seed should I use? Oh, that's like, it's like a 10 minute lecture right there. Um, first I would say figure out what the culprit is. If you had a lot of snow mold, um, that probably was it. Um, maybe you had a lot of leaves there. If you think it's a fungus or a disease, my suggestion is take a picture of it and email it to me or email it to uh, your, your master gardener extension office. And they'll look at it and they'll be able to diagnose exactly what it is. Um, so before you go wild and crazy with the chemicals or dig it up, I would say take a picture of it. We'll figure out what it is and then we can treat it or, um, or replace it. So before you give up on that patch, I would say, let's figure out what it is first. Hopefully that answers that. all of it, all the parts. So. Are there any other questions from anyone? All right, if not, I wanna say a big thank you to Adam and you saw his contact information there on the screen. So I encourage you to either reach out to him or myself at the West Central Research and Outreach Center and we can get you in touch. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Have a great rest of your night.